some more humility about the profession would help everybody, like would help our clients in a way too. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard. Allow me to introduce today's distinguished guest on the podcast, which is David Goodman, a luminary in the realm of architecture and education. Dr. Goodman serves as the Dean of the IE School of Architecture and Design in Madrid, where he leads a vision honed through his tenure as a director of the Bachelor in Architectural Studies and the Master in Architecture. He was educated at Harvard Graduate School of Design and Cornell University, and his own academic journey culminated in a PhD from the IE University specializing in strategy and organizational theory. Dr. Goodman's scholarly pursuits are marked by a focus on architectural innovation amidst socioeconomic flux, co-author of the seminal work An Introduction to Architecture Theory in 1968 to the present. His research has graced prestigious publications like the Journal of Architectural Education and Technology, Architecture and Design. His contributions extend to acclaimed anthologies and critical source books, underscoring his profound impact on architectural discourse. In this episode, David and I talk about the absence of business education inside of architecture and we look at different ways that architectural schools can be accommodating of that and creating a different and more informed context of reality when training design. We look at the power of architectural education and its potential in different fields outside of architecture. Uh, and we also discuss the future of architectural education and we look at different pathways forward. This was a really fascinating conversation. I'm a big fan of everything that they're doing at the IE University. It's one of the most switched on colleges, universities of architecture in the world. And this was a great, great pleasure to be speaking. So sit back, relax and enjoy David Goodman. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. David, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Thanks. Good to be here. So very excited to be speaking with you. I've spoken obviously with your colleague Geronimo in the past. Um, you are the Dean of the IE School of Architecture and Design in Madrid. Um, you have a doctorate in business administration from the IE Business School and a master's, and a master's in architecture from Harvard. Um, really fascinating career that you've had that's kind of uh led you to led you to madrid and you know a very deep knowledge of the business side of architecture and you know i think what you guys are doing at the ie school is you know it's, it's the leading program on the um in the world really for the business side of architecture and is a pretty unique um kind of offering for architects and very, very well needed, obviously. Um, so welcome to the show. Uh, and perhaps we could start a little bit and just talk about your career and how did you get to the position that you are in now? Thanks, well, that's a, that, 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 that question alone probably could, that could do us for about 45 minutes, depending on how I play it. Um, yeah, um, you know, the logical thing to do uh, when you know you want to be an architect is to study comparative literature. So I did that. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I knew, I kind of knew as a, as a little kid that, that I wanted to be an architect, but for some reason, uh, I thought I needed to do something else first, which I should say in, in the American system, uh, we have that luxury of like, you know, 
having an undergraduate that's only marginally related to what you want to do. And then you do a master's, of, um, in my case, a four year master degree. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I went, I, um, I, as a little kid, I, I sort of was drawing and knew I kind of wanted to, to be an architect. But I also really like, I really wanted to be a writer, actually. I couldn't kind of make up, make up my mind. So I, I decided that, um, you know, I was going to be a writer. And um, I, I actually began studying uh, literature. Uh, I moved to Spain to study um, uh, Latin American literature. Another another curious choice, uh, but but my university had a program in Spain, and it was here that I realized what am I doing? Uh, I really want to be an architect. Uh, at that point, it was sort of too late to turn back, and I finished my undergraduate degrees. For, for reasons I won't get into, I finished a degree in political science uh, rather than literature and uh, history of architecture, and then I went to to Harvard where I did a four-year Master of Architecture, and I moved to Spain to practice uh, here, and then uh, eventually uh, back to my native Chicago, um, where I hadn't lived since I was a kid, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I practiced there for a while. But I always knew, I think the place I felt most at home, most comfortable, really, was the academic world. I mean, it just was sort of my, you know, I, in truth, I enjoyed thinking and writing about architecture more than I, found, than I actually enjoyed the practice of architecture. It was just not... You know, it wasn't the rhythm that I, I really wanted, you know, uh, and most of the day to day stuff just wasn't stuff I was particularly interested in or, or frankly, all that good at. Right. Uh, so <clears throat> as soon as I could, I began combining practice with teaching uh, and ultimately became full time faculty uh, at Illinois Institute of Technology. And um, while I was there, I, I heard about this young school in Spain where I'd always you know, I kind of wanted to come back to. And um, at that point, architecture was new at IE. Really, I think they had been teaching it for four years or so. And I, I had known of it as a business school uh, from when I had lived in Spain previously. I didn't know they had anything to do with architecture. And one thing led to another. And I was offered uh, the position to be the director of undergraduate studies. This is now 13 years ago. Um, and as part of that school, from the start was this program in business for, at that point, business for architecture. And uh, now it's uh, Master of Business in Architecture and Design, which was, I think, kind of encapsulated this idea that like it's one thing uh, to um, <clears throat> to learn the discipline of architecture, uh, and it's another to practice it, and that sometimes that chasm, which I lived like painfully, most of us probably mm -hmm. have, right, uh, going out with these like you know world changing ideas and coming face to face with a contract, or coming face to face with why is the phone not ringing, um, <laughs> uh, and um, not really being prepared for it, so. All of this was happening to me. I was being offered this job during the financial meltdown, uh, 2008 it was, right? And seeing mm -hmm. so many of my friends in Chicago being laid off, you know, one morning uh, uh, in big firms there and, and seeing what, you know, how uh, the kind of lack of resilience we had as a profession. So when I came here, I felt that we were doing really some of the right things. And, and one of the right things I thought was um, really dealing with business at the undergrad level, the graduate level, but dealing with it as, as a as a designed process, you know, I mean, you can design a practice like you design anything uh, and you think about it. How do I get to, if this is the result I want, how do I get there? And the other thing was to think, and, and I guess we'll talk about this maybe a little bit more was to separate as much as we could the discipline of architecture from the, from the profession. That is, we're going to teach the discipline of architecture. For some of my students, it will be great for them to go on to be architects which is a wonderful, noble, fantastic profession, but not mm -hmm. all of them need to or will want to. And so what we were trying to do is to prepare them for that kind of more varied uh, professional world. Anyway, that's how I got here. While I was here, um, I knew I wanted to do a PhD and I was really interested in some of the stuff that Skid Rowings and Merrill um, was doing in the 30s, actually, right when they started. They were, they were started right in the middle of the Great Depression. And I began that as a, a thesis uh, at the Polytechnic here in Madrid in architecture, but I soon realized this was actually more of a business PhD um, and had to do more with organization. And uh, so I, I, while I was uh, here, I, I did my doctorate uh, at the business school talking about well, two different things. One, organizations founded in, in moments that are, uh, I think the technical term is crappy. Mm -hmm. uh, Term of art in, in really negative um, socio political economic moments. What happens so this, to organizations? This, this is kind of SOM being founded kind of just post the Great Depression. Right, right. I mean, 37, I think it is. So, also you know, kind of still in the second dip of the, of the Depression. Um, right. 
that's one part of it. So it was started with SOM kind of gradually had very little to do with SOM. But then the other thing was, okay, well, um, the other thing I was interested in was, well, what do architecture firms do um, in this balance between standing out and fitting in, right? Because you, and, and SOM was really good at that because look at the name of that firm, like Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. It could be McKim, Mead, and White. It could be any kind of classical uh, American firm. But behind that screen of, of kind of conformity and anonymity or, or traditional architecture, from what they were doing behind it was radical, mm -hmm. radical. Um, it had nothing to do with what went before. So they were at once like super normative in what they looked like from the outside. But if you knew what was going on inside, it was it was something totally different. So I thought that was well, super I, interesting. I, I guess that's that's also very interesting because I you know I've got a, a, a you know an interest in the, the big American firms as well and their influence on pretty much all other architecture firms that we see today like we look at the fosters and the uh and these these other behemoths that exist today the genslers they all have that kind of legacy or heritage owed to the those pra those early practices in the 19 1930s of the, in the u.s who were who were and they, who were kind of capitalizing as well on the, the the massive shift in construction techniques and being able to operate at a scale that architects had never operated at before, really. You know, Nat Owings in his in his autobiography says something that um, to the effect of like we could do what the Gothic Age did, that we could be kind of these nameless but highly trained collaborative professionals. He said, he said yeah, we could be like the Gothic building guild or something like this, he says. Uh, that was, that was the, the highly like, you know, kind of very idealistic aim. Um, and I mean, it's kind of amazing what those guys were able to do. I mean, in some sense they were in the right place in the right time and knew the right people, but I mean, that's, to, to, to whom does that not apply? <laughs> yeah. um, they, were, they were very smart and did some brilliant design, had a really good eye for designers. They knew who wasn't a designer. Um, and they knew who was, and they, they, they looked out for that, and they set up a structure. Like, they, they thought about the organization. You know, they theorized the organization. They designed the organization. It didn't just happen. And I think so many of us think, oh, yeah, like, that'll, that'll come. Like, the structure will come. Like, um, no, no. Uh, at least that's not how they got. So, you, so you, you wrote this doctorate that was essentially about the, the kind of organizational structure of of SOM and it became a, a, a doctorate in business administration. Um, and then it did start to influence your teaching. That's a good question. Oh, um, I mean, it's kind of going on in parallel. I mean, certainly like the dissertation ended up having very little to do with SOM and much more to do with kind of architecture in Chicago at that moment. Uh, right. And yeah. navigating that tension between distinct distinctiveness and conformity, and mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, f for sure, it led when we were working on the. Uh, um, at that point, I was only involved in the architecture program. When we were developing our new master in architecture, we kind of knew. Um, so our master in architecture is is like the the last stage that you need in Spain to become a professional a licensed architect in Spain and in the EU. And so it's, it's obviously very much oriented to the profession. If you don't want to be a, a registered architect, don't take the master, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's how more people see it. But I thought, well, no, actually, like we, you could use it for something way more interesting than that. And we embedded this business component to it, the design management module. And it only, it only reaffirmed what I, what I thought was the case when I, when I arrived here, those two things. We've got to separate the discipline from the profession because there's so many professions that architecture prepares you to, to work in, you know, mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're wasting in a way, not wasting, but we're like overly limiting the influence that architects can have on design culture or, or the environment broadly, broadly understood by, by just limiting it to the built environment. Second was that we don't know what we're doing when it comes to business, generally speaking, right? Mm -hmm. And so that there really is room, it's almost like it's our obligation. It's not, not a luxury, it's an obligation. And I was kind of critical of my own training and, and to, be, to be honest with you, in my professional practice class, I probably slept through most of it because I didn't place much importance on it. Um, yes. Of late working on my project, and if I stumbled in, you know, I tried to stay awake yeah. as best I could, but I was a terrible yeah. student. And I, so, <laughs> but that's kind of the, like the, the message that's being sent to students is, is design culture first and management to the degree that you want to get your hands dirty should only be in the service of that design. But we don't tend to like turn that design 
interest back on practice itself and kind of look mm -hmm. at practice, you know, and, and um, talk about. No, that, that, that's, that's so interesting because I, I would, you know, I've often said I would hate to see um, business education at university just become, you know, a classroom where they're teaching you generally applied accounting principles or getting you to look at profit and loss spreadsheets or things like that. It needs to be, it needs to have that, where it becomes interesting is when you put the, the design lens onto it and we start talking about designing a business or a vehicle that can produce design um, as opposed to just kind of, you know, isolating the business component of it and, and sticking it on to a design course where exactly you end up, what ends up happening is no, well, no one wants to attend the business course because you've got the fun and excitement of doing something creative. And now it feels like you're trying to tick a box um, just by having somebody attend, um, you know, the professional practice part of it. I know very much when I was at university, the, that kind of culture existed where everyone begrudgingly went to the professional practice um, um, seminars because you had to, because it was just part of the component, part of the, you know, the curriculum. And it was just, it, but it was more of a tick box exercise. Um, the problem of that is that that attitude ends up prevailing into the profession, even when people start set up their own practices. And so people don't have any kind of reverence or interest in designing their own businesses. And as a result, we have a lot of problems. Yeah, I think you absolutely nailed it there. I mean, that is that is um, that sort of boredom with or almost like outright disdain for the business component has led us into some very difficult professional lives, actually, you know, and then compound that with my generation. OK, so I'm kind of this like uh, indie rock uh, post punk generation that saw commercial success as somehow incompatible with. <laughs> with like decent uh art you know um yes. yes right and so there was that too when i was in school like you know you know <laughs> uh that 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 disdain which really you have to get over quickly if you want to eat uh and then if you want to change the world in any meaningful way you've got it you've got to get past this right yes um, <laughs> and i both wanted to change the world and eat uh so so both <laughs> of those things i think so, so, um, I mean, and, and again, that's, that's interesting in architecture in general, when we see the, even design being taught, you know, I, I've always found it quite interesting that, uh, there's the complete removal of economic context in design school. And I've, you know, I, that, that's a big shame as well, because it's kind of a, because it, it unintentionally sets up a paradigm, if you like, that money is a constraint or that the financial context of which architecture operates is something that we, you know, we, we will take the advantage of ignoring it at university so that we can be uninhibited in our creativity. And again, that kind of negation of the economic context has, has an impact through design. And also just kind of it perpetuates an unhelpful attitude, you know, and, and certainly from my work now, when I'm working with a lot of architects, we're training them in business. Um, and there's a lot of, it's not necessarily the mechanics of business, because that's not that difficult as such, but the culture around it and the mindset that is, that's much more deeply ingrained. And this negative attitude or profit is a dirty word or just the idea of making money is incompatible with great design. That's a really harmful, really, really harmful belief that the profession kind of um, uh, has un unintentionally perpetuated. Yeah. And there's a, there's a corollary of that. And that is the lifestyle that architects live is right. based, is based on free labor, our own, uh, sometimes those are interns, uh, and none of it is passed on to, or little of it, I should, I, should, should, I should measure my words, little of it tends to be passed on to the client, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So we therefore are, are, are sabotaging our own businesses and our own health and lives and the value of an hour of our time, precisely because we think it's a, you know, we, we think it's a cause 
uh, to which one should, should dedicate oneself nobly uh, at great loss. W if we do that, we leave it only to the people who can afford such loss, <laughs> right? And yeah. can afford uh, a hobby in architecture, which is what it becomes at that point, a subsidized hobby. That's not right. right. Uh, the, other, the other part of this is also, well, good design is economical, right? I mean, I mean, I think this is also tied up with sustainability. Right? And I struggle with what you talked about, like this idea, well, we'll deal, with it, we'll deal with budgets later. We don't budget our projects in school. We don't. We're not, mm -hmm. we don't have quantity surveyors. We, we, you know, we're not doing that in our school. Mm -hmm. we, we just have a picture, much as probably it's been done for, for a long time in that sense, right? But what we try to do is to link it to sustainability, link a certain economy of means, right, with, with, uh, with reducing our footprint. And I think mm -hmm. that that is... Also, there's like a lucky, a fortuitous overlap of what is what is economically feasible and what is sustainable. So a lot of reuse uh, and sort of minimizing, um, I guess maybe a certain humility, uh, certain humility in, in 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 design. So I think around the board, wherever I go, you don't see very much heroic. I mean, you do at certain schools, but you don't see so much heroic gesture, uh, mm -hmm. enormous cantilevers and, and magically floating volumes like this mercifully and seems made, to have buildings made out of ferro fluids and <laughs> it exists. You, you, you know where I'm talking about, but, but, <laughs> but, but, and that's also cool. Like, I'm glad those places exist. That's just not what we're, you know, we want to, uh, be a little bit more tactical, like, you know, um, and the, mm, bang for the buck is the expression in, in American English, at least, um, you know, to, to, to choose your battles and, and um, otherwise be, be economical. Uh, and that doesn't mean to have low ambition, right? That means use the constraint. Any good designer knows that a constraint is an opportunity for invention. So budget mm -hmm. constraint is another. Thing. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, exactly. I mean, that, that's a very interesting point is that, you know, architecture, where it, you typically in design where we're spoken, we talk about, constraints or these friction points being the generators of architecture and a budget or financial consideration or a consideration of who the client is and you know how they're being funded that can actually generate an interesting set of design solutions or what you're saying here in terms of sustainability or kind of um, resilience in in materials and design or longevity that becomes a good place for creating friction which encourages more thoughtful design and gives us something gives us something to be able to work with H how do you um then with the because you, you've got the mba degree and then there's like a, a master's degree of architecture so the two are, are different yeah it's the mbr the master of business MBR. Architecture. Yeah. yeah this is typically a post-professional uh degree tends to be a little, you know, um, not immediately after graduation. Um, and it's it's not only for architects. I mean, designers may take it as well, although it ends up being 90% uh, architecture. The the MARC is the professional master's degree. So in, and in Spain, you do a five-year undergraduate and then a mm -hmm. one-year master and you're licensed. So it's not like in the UK or the US where there's an internship component. Uh, no, there's no practice component, which leads us to have a slightly more practical, perhaps, uh, undergraduate education than in the UK or in, in, in the States or, or Canada, where, where yeah. you have, you have steps right after, um, we don't, so we are the, we are the final, the final uh, step before licensure. So our, our master in architecture, uh, the content of that, strangely enough, um, or not strangely enough, unfortunately enough on paper, roughly 70% of the content is, is set by the state, right? Because it's licensing. So they say, okay, you must know X, Y, Z. Um, but they say you have a little margin. Uh, you have methodology. We've been super innovative in, in how we do it. We work with Ben Van Berkel, uh, UN Studio, a super entrepreneurial architect. Um, we, we integrate sustainability in, in, in the first term, especially. Um, and we take our students to Amsterdam. They work on real projects with UN Studio. Um, and um, but the real um, say content innovation was to add the design management module. So our students mm -hmm. get a class in strategic management for architects project management um, and uh, creativity and organization, which is one that I really like because it's, that's the one where we're saying, okay, you know, apply your creativity to thinking about organization design. And um, 
you know, I think some students are sort of um, puzzled by this and, and most of them, from my experience, are, are super excited about the chance to think about it uh, in those terms, like as, as a creative pursuit. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's our master in architecture. They're both one year programs. Great. Amazing. Amazing. I've, I've spoken with um, some of your past students of the, uh, the MBARC before. Um, Tosin was on the show not so long ago. Um, we had a good conversation about some of her insights and things that she that she learnt. So, it, we were we were last time we spoke. We we were talking about this idea of institutional theory. Yeah. Um, um, could you talk a little bit about that? What what does that mean, and how does that relate here in terms of the the kind of business side of architecture? Great. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so institutional theory is a, a very important theoretical framework uh, in the study of organizations and sociology. At, 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 at its base, institutional theory says that we're actually not as free when we design our organizations. We're not as free as we might wish or we're not as free as we might think that there is to a degree what they call external control of our organizations. That is, we have to fit in. Mm -hmm. Not fitting in has great penalties. Let's say um, on the most basic level, in, in regulatory terms, well, you have to have a license. You can't just say, oh, hey, I'm an architect because I, I watched The Fountainhead. You know, uh, I, I watched the Netflix series. I know you can't do that, right? So then the state will come and, and, and carry you off to, to, to an uncomfortable place if you do that. Um, that's like the most basic level. So there's regulatory conformity. No, we all must be licensed. We must go to a certain school. Those schools are also constrained, right, by the state or whatever regulatory authority there might be, right? That's the kind of easiest to understand. Then there is uh, competitive uh, conformity. Hmm. Everybody else is doing this. If I don't say, for example, in the time of skid rowings in Merrill, okay, it was almost unheard of. And, I, and in my, my dissertation, I saw in the population of architects at the time that skid rowings in Merrill were founded, there were about 500 firms in the Chicago area, something like 499 of them uh, used the last names of the, the principals or the last mm -hmm. name of the, of the principal. Sounds like a silly thing, right? Of course, you know, David Goodman architect. Um, uh, had they chosen to call themselves, you know, Building Solutions Incorporated or, or, or I don't know, uh, Studio uh, uh, Bow Wow, Atariya Bow Wow, uh, had they decided to do that in 1937, they probably wouldn't have gotten any clients whatsoever, certainly not the U.S. military, okay? So um, there's a certain amount of conformity, even if it's not conscious. conscious. If you are in a certain stream of, let's say, avant-garde architecture firms, and you call yourself, you know, uh, uh, David Goodman Architect LLC, um, that's not likely to make you sound as sexy as choose any any noun, any you know, uh, salad fork studio. <laughs> salad fork studio is a more convincing name nowadays. Like, you know, like any noun that has nothing to do with architecture, that could be the name of your firm. And it's pretty Freak. normal. <laughs> Yeah, whatever you have in hand, that's cool. You know, uh, that, that I like that, work. yeah. Yeah, I think Salad Fork would, for sure would have worked. Um, but um, <laughs> Soup Spoon, harder to say, but, but nevertheless melodious. Um, but but um, yeah, so you can, you can um, nowadays there's almost the, in, the reverse pressure. If you're, a cert, if you're an architecture firm with a certain degree of ambition, you must put some sort of inscrutable name or, or acronym, right? There are, there, there, are, there are counter examples as well. But what I'm saying is that specific pressure has changed over time. Those pressures are socially constructed and mm -hmm. they're not regulatory. Um, and there are certain things that an architect would not do. OK, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the series Better Call Saul. I have uh, seen, I've seen a few episodes of it. OK, well, I mean, so he begins as a respectable lawyer and explains his his path to one of those guys who advertises on late night TV. And he sheds all of those layers of like, like what you should not do if you're a legitimate lawyer. He starts in yeah. his brother's firm, right? And he gradually becomes, loses all of that. And there's freedom in that, but nobody will take him seriously in the world of the serious law firm. Mm -hmm. um, architects, we do much the same, much the same. And, 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 and uh, that's another kind of, uh, um, let's say, inhibitor to innovation, right? Mm -hmm. It is 
it is the very real pressure to conform in order to be taken seriously. And the third is lack of any better ideas. Not everybody has great ideas, so we imitate, right? And so we end up um, almost by default sometimes not questioning models uh, that are set up for what a firm looks like, where a firm should operate, what a firm should call itself. And, and so all of those constitute institutional factors to conformity. Now, That's there's another really... Yeah, right. So those are the, kind of intuitively when you explain like that, ah, it all makes sense. We all live those things. Yeah. But then there's something else that's super interesting. Um, there's this paper by uh, um, Meyer and Rao in 1977, uh, which talks about the split between what architects actually need to do. An architect, sorry, they don't mention architecture. What organizations really need to do for efficiency. And I, when I mean when I say efficiency, I mean like just to get the job done. What do you need to do? In order to respond to the demands of your clients or customers, whatever they are, there, there's a certain amount of stuff you need to do to, to get the work done in a timely way, right? And then there's the other stuff you need to do to be institutionally sound, to look like a serious firm, to do what a firm should do, not do what a firm should not do, right? Uh, and sometimes these two things are at odds. What if, um, <clears throat> for example, it's, it's frowned upon, as it was by the American Institute of Architects, to offer structural engineering services. It's not illegal. Um, what if it's against the law to, uh, or, 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 not, or frowned upon by the, by, the, by the industry to advertise your services? Or what if um, being a general contractor is uh, considered to be unethical by the professional associations, which it was in the United States, right? right. Well, then a, lot of the, a lot of the things that you would want to do for efficiency, no, I want to be the GC, and I want to be the architect, but the professional association tells me that's unethical. So I have to make a decision. Either I have to not do what they're telling me not to do, or I have to do what, what in, in institutional theory is called decoupling, mm -hmm. which is basically lying. I have to mm -hmm. show the world one thing and then with, at the same time be doing something else. So that decoupling is how you can conform with the image that society wants you to, 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 to comply with. While you need to, while you do the stuff you need to do, so a lot of institutional theory has to do with that tension between what I really would like to do and what I have to do, and and uh, part of what I tried to explore in my dissertation was kind of well, okay, what are the over time because I studied all of firms working in Chicago uh, as part of my dissertation, there are several parts, but one is like over a period of eighty years, there's this tension between uh, fitting in and standing out. Uh, what uh, over time, what were the ways of fitting in that remained uh, important and where was it possible to innovate? And then the other question was in moments of crisis, when things are really bad, like, like you know, you can imagine like fitting in the status quo is, is nice when things are going well, but when, when everything is falling apart, do you think maybe there'd be more freedom to experiment? And that was another mm -hmm. thing I tested. So um, if a firm was founded in the moment in the Great Depression, like SOM, was there more freedom to innovate or was it uh, was it more constrained? Uh, I'll leave that there as a cliffhanger. <laughs> well, that that's that's so interesting. Um, the the kind of constraints of the profession itself, which are kind of implied, or um, you know, of you needing and wanting to to fit into your own profession, actually being an inhibitor to business innovation. Um, you know, just in the way that you might market, name yourself, the way you're structuring yourself, and there's a and this it's actually very obvious when you say it like that um, for why architects are very cautious with even um, um, employing an outside business consultant. So us at Business of Architecture, we're definitely one of our advantages with the business education we've provided. And I imagine that a similar, a similar with you guys is that, well, you're architects or you're associated with an architect with architectural education and the, the design of architecture. Whereas architects traditionally have been very, very um, suspicious, if you like, of um, external consultants coming coming in and telling them how to do their their business, and they'll often confide in you know in my, you know when I speak with them, they'll often say things like, "Well, yeah, but they don't understand architecture, or they don't they don't understand a profession, or we needed somebody who um, understands the the profession," and it's actually more to do with this kind of caution or concern of stepping outside of the the institution which has which so much investment has gone into becoming part of um i i in my own practice i recall 
at one point um considering abandoning ba- abandoning the word architect there's obviously there's, there's a lot of um marketing strength and kind of prestige that comes with the word but i often used to find just f- as a way of thinking i feel really constrained calling myself an architect and i'd like to do something very different and as a result never joined the roba or any of the professional bodies um had my registration and i know a lot of other other architects kind of feel like that 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 you know okay i could i will need to use the word architect but any further going into the institutions then feel like i'm being influenced in a certain in a certain way how how would you suggest that that the profession kind of approaches this and tries to have more freedom inside of itself more freedom to experiment that's a great um that's a great question um and and, and what you say is, is it's so true like there's the the name itself is so charged right the architect that it often creates the most rigid kind of structure which is a structure that's self-constructed right mm-hmm. we can chafe at and complain about regulations that come from without. But when we are the ones who build uh, the iron cage, right? And that's a, that's a, that's a, um, a phrase that, that, that um, you know, organization theorists use that, that, um, to describe that kind of conformity. When we built it ourselves, then we don't even see it, right? Um, and so by, by dropping off the name architect, maybe it lets us be more experimental with what it is we're really doing. And it might be for that reason that, I I mean, I have to tell you, I think maybe half of our students go on to uh, practice architecture, maybe half, um, maybe less. And that doesn't mean that they're not working in creative industries or or in design or even on buildings, Um, but they they might not think of themselves as architects because I think maybe we do do too good a job or we do a very good job at explaining this to them. There's more, your, your design abilities could be um, could be useful beyond uh, architecture, but but going back to architecture itself, you know, I think we also have to be realistic about what are the useful constraints and what are the ones that we've just built ourselves, yes, uh, right, and and which are the ones that we just never thought about, never questioned. That said, there are also things that have never been done and for good reason, right? <laughs> um, so so not everything, not every blue you know, blue water uh, idea is a good one just because no one's done it before. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think it, I would, again, apply our thinking as designers to the problem of what do, like, what is it that we want to do with our lives? What do you want to wake up every day and do? Because ultimately the money is, is there, money is there, but let's, let's talk first about like, what do you want your Monday morning to be? Like, what do you want to go to work to do every Monday morning? Because you have to design that. Or if you, if you just let it happen, you find yourself, you know, 20 years down the road with a practice specializing in something you hate. Um, and so, no, you know, you've got to, I think, think very clearly about what it is you want to do. And then what do you do better than others? Right. And, and stop calling it architecture for a while. I love that you, you, you say that because you kind of have to think about it. Don't assume the answer will be architecture. Maybe the answer is something else or something that's called something else. And then only once you've gone through that process of ideation, which we would do if we were designing a building or a coffee cup, um, you know, once we do that, once we then we say, okay, what have I what have I created? You know, what have I what did mm-hmm. I just decide? Architecture firm? Is it a consulting firm? Um, am I really good at writing specifications? And is that what I want to do? Every, you know, like the, whatever it might be. You know, uh, that maybe you're not an architect. Maybe you're a, a client services provider, or maybe you're uh, involved in real estate. But that's because that's what you really want to be doing, and that's you know no longer architecture. I think there's freedom in it, but I, I would also hate for people who really do want to be focused on the built environment for them to feel that they can't use the word architect, which is almost a, a sacred word. You know, it would mm-hmm. be a shame <laughs> to abandon that word, but I totally see why why one would. Yeah, I find this this kind of idea of decoupling the profession from the discipline actually very interesting. And, you know, the fact that you were saying there that 50% of your students don't go on to becoming an architect is actually actually quite quite empowering and that there's it's something quite important for us to be able to see the different trains of of 
of where you can go with your profession. How do you guys instill that into the into your education, this decoupling from the discipline versus the profession? Hmm. I should say, I think there is um, already in the DNA of our, of our institution, this very entrepreneurial spirit um, <clears throat> as a school that's kind of born out of the business school, right? Uh, I happen to have studied there myself, but not, you know, very few of our professors have. But nevertheless, we're in this environment where it's just very entrepreneurial and thinking about, you know, what's the problem really? What is actually the problem? You know, and, and interrogating that over and over and over again. And, and that very conversation of like, well, what is it you, what are you interested in really? I mean, I know you like architecture, but like, what do you really want to be doing? <clears throat> I think we just have those conversations. The other is, um, while we always have, they do have to design buildings. I mean, there's no way around that. It's an architecture school. <clears throat> we complement that with a lot of other things uh, in the architecture program. So there's a whole sequence of courses related to experimentation, which can be installation, art, film. You know, we, we, we make sure that they all have uh, experiences in other creative fields. And I think it's, it sometimes opens eyes. We've got students who end up working in digital art, uh, several actually. Uh, in virtual environments, kind of, you know, video gamey kind of things, a lot over there. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people in lighting design, for example. Um, so, um, or, or, or fashion, or, or adjacent to the fashion industry. So I think it's, it's you know, using this, it's, we, we kind of instill this idea, even though in, here we do require them to work on buildings because we're a, a licensed granting institution, mm -hmm. uh, we, we try to complement that as much as we can with other, uh, with other experiences, other input and 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 maybe crucially <clears throat> to demonstrate that that's not less you know and, and i think a lot of architecture schools like kind of maybe implicitly like look at those others other fields as being somehow less mm -hmm. maybe that's, and that's oversimplifying the case but i well, I, I, I think that, that that's interesting you know i've, I've often found in architect you know um, from my own personal experience going through architecture school probably I didn't ever, I know I did my best throughout my entire architectural education to avoid designing a building wherever possible. And, you know, I, I went to one of these avant-garde schools in, in London and, you know, ha was able to have the freedom to like, just avoid designing a building, except when there was some part of it that needed to be reba accredited. And then in, in you just design a, a concrete box and tick off all the building regs. And then, you know, and then you go off designing whatever kind of, um, computer coded um performance gown that i was creating uh but but, but I, I think that that becomes interesting because the but the pathway to becoming an architect certainly um in the uk i always felt you were on this track and you could play but it was like a very strong calling to become an architect and part of it was the snobbiness of it where it was kind of like yeah you, I could do these other this other stuff, but now I've I've said I'm going to become an architect, and being the architect that's the that's the real thing. Um, and and, we have and it, it might it's real. <laughs> and it, and it kind of begs the question as well then that if you've got a design degree or an architectural degree that can be used for so many different things, why even why even call it architecture? Um, and what would happen? What would happen if you totally pulled it out of architecture and then architecture became something that you know to be a practicing architect you did it solely inside of a professional tract Ooh. and there's problems with that as well but i'm interested to hear your <laughs> thoughts on yeah that's interesting i mean i look i <clears throat> i would i would i would fight that <clears throat> totally and i don't think it's at all contradictory with what i was saying earlier <clears throat> i would fight mm -hmm. that because I believe that it's a, it's a, an ancient, beautiful, all-consuming, broad, engaging discipline, right? And that discipline is called architecture. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it, it, it deserves defending, right? And, and deserves handing down to other generations. I really do think so. I think we have to be custodians of that discipline mm -hmm. and not lose sight of it because it's, it's precisely what is specific about the discipline of architecture that makes it so valuable as a training for so many things. All I'm saying is it's <clears throat> such a good training. Um, it teaches so many things, you know, 
um, both analytical, creative, teamwork, communication skills, graphic skills. It develops every bit of a, of a human. I think it is. I can't think of a more comprehensive way of, of learning, and that is called architecture. Now. Uh, I don't think that always has to translate into the sort of arrogance about the professional choices. I mean, I think it is the hardest working, maybe medical students work as hard as architects, maybe, probably. Uh, law students, some places too. But, um, but like that doesn't mean, and that sort of arrogance is also born in the schools, at least out of, look how hard we're working. Right? We are sure. the only one, all the other students are asleep, but we're up. You know, um, uh, I, I do think we should turn that, that lens back on ourselves and ask, this is a parenthetical ask, is that really necessary? But, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I think, I think, uh, I, I would, I would so, uh, it, it would so sadden me to see the name architecture disappear as a discipline. I don't think that's, I don't think that's what I'm saying. I, I wouldn't want to see that, but mm -hmm. I do think that some more humility about the profession would help everybody, like would help our clients in a way too. I think, you know, architects have this messianic kind of streak um, that hasn't done great things for people. We are generally, you know, um, slightly on the arrogant side of the spectrum, I think. And I think we're seen mm -hmm. to be that way, which ultimately isn't great for the business because people don't really want to be lectured to constantly by their architect. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah sure. Do, do, you, do you think the profession um, could be involved in expanding the remit of what an architect does so say for example we see you know i, I think it's really fascinating actually that these days you can get a, an architectural training and it's also it, it kind of sad in a way um that you can go through your architectural training and actually you can be compensated financially far better in a different field that actually appreciates the architectural thinking and design synthesis skills that you get from university. We see this in tech all the time where they're, you know, and UX designers and, you know, they've interviewed a number of UX designers who were architects and then they've, they've moved over to UX. It's not an easy transition and it takes quite a bit to pull themselves out of the profession. Um, but then within a few years, the salaries are unfathomably more rewarding than what they would be getting in the architectural uh, space and in many ways i often think that architectural traditional architectural practice doesn't utilize the skills and these kind of creative synthesis skills that are, is so wonderful about architectural education and it's almost like leaving it on the table and i often think is is there space there for the profession to even expand what an architect does particularly as we're kind of moving into this world of virtual and digital spaces um, and we're living more and more of our lives online and there's this kind of organizational discipline that the architect is so good at being able to you know bring in what what, what were your your thoughts on on that well you make a great point that the profession has a choice to make in the face of this challenge right and it will mm -hmm. it have the just as they did in the in the say, 1930s in the states, um, if you trace the um, the AIA bylaws, or the AIA recommendations for, for professional professional conduct, they gradually came to accept practice that included general contracting, <clears throat> structural engineering, right? Um, and they so the, the 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 attitude of the profession was to embrace the change or accept it at least. And I think now the question is, what would the professional organizations do? <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Question is, what will the professional organizations do in the face of these new challenges, which could seem, you know, like architecture is dissolving into um, UX design, video game design, virtual environment design. <clears throat> I think that's great. I mean, uh, I think it's great that architecture touch those things. Um, I think if we don't do it, we are condemned to be a metaphor for other things. Architecture. I mean, mm -hmm. if you do a Google, a Google uh, Scholar search for articles published on architecture. I think you have to go like down to like the 200th to get beyond information technology articles or, or, meta, or, or gen genetics articles where architecture is just a metaphor for other things. Mm -hmm. So if we don't understand that <clears throat> no information architecture, actually, maybe we can bring something to that field. <laughs> um, yes. Organization design, this is part of what I was trying to do. Well, what if, a re what if you know, we bring a design approach to organization design? 
Um, so I, I think if the if the profession, like the profession, and then the professional organizations, to the degree that they're they're influential in this matter, I'm not sure they are. But to the degree that a profession sees, no, I'm an architect, and I my field is buildings. Well, I'm an architect, and my field is uh, data. Um, I, I think I think that to me is um, is could be freeing and, and very interesting. I, I think I hope the profession accepts these things as legitimate um, ways of practice. Otherwise, people will always have the thing: I have to leave my field to do what I what I you know mm. uh, to do what I what I like. Imagine if <clears throat> you've ever worked in hospitals. I never have. Okay, from what I understand, it's like a different world altogether. You know, There's, yeah. it's just it's a different kind of practice. <clears throat> um, nevertheless, we call it architecture. Right. Specializing in hospitals, um, probably utterly unlike uh, a two person practice working on houses. Right? There must be almost nothing in common. Um, mm -hmm. So what would be the so, so different? Let's say, well, I'm working in virtual spaces, you know, um, <clears throat> in the metaverse or whatever it is we call it. I don't think it's so different. I think it's probably closer in many ways to the, the two person office built doing houses uh, than the international hospital firm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, th I think it's a really interesting, it's an interesting opportunity for lots of the institutional governing bodies of architecture to, to kind of potentially capitalize on or as opposed to being reactive to uh, a kind of proactive approach of where the, what the future of the, of what the profession could be. Um, you know, I think that it opens up a lot of, a lot more opportunities and a lot more freedom, a lot more freedom. Do you see this in the firms you work with, a uh, desire to kind of push the, the, the limits of what is architecture practice? Not, not, with the f not necessarily with the firms that we work with. I mean, the, the, typically the firms we work with are traditional architectural practices. Mm -hmm. um, what we do see with them is them introducing different services, which are kind of traditionally architectural related. So you know, we've got loads of clients who build out an interior design firm, or they build out a, a contracting firm, or they become developers themselves. And that's another thing that I'm a big kind of advocate for, because, you know, becoming the developer yourself, um, you know, that that's where you get to, you know, you're the one now directing the creativity and what you want to build. And it encompasses you know, a solid understanding of business and economics and raising finance. And that gives a lot of, a lot of freedom. Um, typically I see a lot of students who I will speak with on a more informal basis, who are looking to, who are frustrated in the profession, um, and then start looking around at, you know, where do they, where do they want to go? How do they want to, to practice architecture? And then this leads them to, um, moving into different fields. I don't know if you've come across of Out of Architecture with um, Jake and Erin. So they're a mm -hmm. consulting agency in the US and they actually specialize in helping take people out of architecture and locate them into other professions. Um, you know, and their, their own stories are really interesting because I think Jake, um, he now works at Adidas um, and found, you know, he was using all of his 3D design skills in making new trainers and renders and, you know, just economically, it made so much more sense to be using those skills inside of, you know, a, a creative company like this. I, I do speak on the, on the podcast, a, a lot of practices who, you know, have moved into the world of say brand experience, which is a kind of, you know, that's an architectural interpretation of branding. And I think that's very interesting and placemaking. So we start to see these kind of periphery um, um, parts of the profession opening up and being very innovative and, you know, pushing the kind of the physical boundary of what architecture can be and starting to integrate it into um, something which is a little bit less, you know, confined in a, in a building. Um, which again, I think is, you know, is, is really good. And, but there's so much, there's, you know, there's, I, I think certainly younger students have got so much opportunity and are brought up in the, the YouTube generation, if you like, and are very well aware of different ways of making money of different, um, ways of communicating, of marketing, of selling, um, I have a different relationship with physical space, 
you know, we grew up in an era where our bedrooms were these little havens of our expression of personality. And now people have social media profiles, which become the bed, you know, the equivalent of the bedroom wall. So there's a real sort of cultural shift that's happening. And, you know, the, the future of architecture is kind of, I think it's, 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 it's interwoven into that. I think um, there's a different entrepreneur, different relationship with entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship nowadays than there was when, when I was in school, <clears throat> certainly, for yeah. sure, right? Because I think that ethic of like, well, don't be too successful, um, you know, you wouldn't want to sell out, right? Uh, this was very much, uh, as, as I mentioned before, it was like, you know, there all the time. And it's not there any of the time nowadays, yeah. uh, for better and worse, right? A little of that, <clears throat> a little of that wouldn't hurt. Um, I'm showing my age, but, but certainly like younger generations have this kind of like, you know, entrepreneurial spirit from the start. They can sell, uh, they don't see it as in any way in contradiction with artistic aspirations, which they've got clearly, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and they express it through, you know, kind of personal branding and, and, uh, influence right. exactly. and they, they got that, they've got that, like that's their, in their DNA, most of them see. Um, I think then, then they're even like further self-selecting the ones that come to our school because they know we're, we're, we're kind of in this businessy environment. Like they're already a little bit, maybe even more like this. But I think it's generational. I see it with my, with my daughter, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so yeah. like I think maybe they'll be free of some of that self-sabotage that, that my generation engaged in for a while. And, and they have most, and by the way, it only, it, 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 it only resulted in kind of later coming to terms with the business aspects of artistic practice, right? Um, it didn't mean resigning themselves to it. It was just like, no, I've got to deal with this. I hadn't really taken it seriously until now. I'm going to kind of reskill. Uh, but I think, um, but I, I do wonder though, like about the, the integration of that with architecture. You know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see as we make this leap into you know, AI powered practice, what is it that we refuse to let go of, right? I mean, the, mm -hmm. because some things we will no longer be doing, it's just inevitable. Some things, just as we no longer have departments of, of draftsmen or drafts, you know, uh, we will, there will be people who aren't doing things in architecture firms anymore. But it will be interesting is what we define as being the essential human uh, human element of architecture. And then other 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 areas of work will open up. I think this is a good opportunity to have that conversation. Where are the, yeah. the limits of practice? No, absolutely. And you, know, you bring up there the, the kind of AI revolution that we're kind of entering into. You had someone like Sam Altman, um, you know, recently saying that they're in the future. We are not far. We're not far off having a one-person billion-dollar annual revenue company, which is that's just it's insane. It's insane to think that that's that that's the future that we're stepping into. And what does that mean for an architecture practice? I mean, in that context, you know, there's so much drudgery in architecture that could be replaced, which actually means, I think, that the architect can step back into this synthesizer role and the one who's able to look around and, you know, create and join ideas together and be a, a be more of a, a curatorial position. Um, you know, technology can can relinquish and free up the, the architect a lot. You know, architecture is a funny business model where you often have very highly trained people doing basic, very basic tasks. Oh, yeah. And that makes it very, very inefficient. And there's the freedom of, of um, AI to replace a lot of that. I know we're seeing AI at the moment involved in lots of creative things, which is kind of, you know, that's where it's getting its kind of marketing push, if you like. But, but really, from a practical sense, we want to hold that creative thinking to us. And AI can, can do a lot of the decision, make, decision making things and um, regulatory processes inside of a practice that ch take up so much time and are very repetitive. I think had we had AI, so much of the, the things that I, that I mentioned at the start, like what I didn't really enjoy about practice, mm -hmm. You know, for I'm sure many of the many of the people who are watching the podcast can relate. For about a, you know a year and a half, two years, uh, I remember working on a large project where every morning my job was pick up a, a, a like a, a, a crate 
of samples, you know, of uh, submittals to make sure that, you know, the, which, which the contractor was sending us to verify that they were what we'd specified, which I had to sign, stamp, inspect. And, and this was, you know, a, 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 a menial task above all menial, ta menial tasks, which involved me stamping them, folding them, sending them back, you know, in the mail. Um, <clears throat> there, I, I, I actually contributed nothing to the project. All of my training, all of my, my ability contributed to nothing. If AI, nothing, nothing. And probably I was bad at it, probably because I was so detached from it. You know, a, a bot could have done that job better and I could have been doing something else. The question then is what I've had a job at all. Um, <laughs> but, but, not the question for a different podcast, but, uh, <clears throat> but certainly like that part of practice, I, I hope it goes away. I mean, would anybody really miss that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know, perhaps um, not me. Yeah, no, that's, that's very interesting. Well, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation here. We've got, I, I, I sense that there's many more hours that we could be, we could be talking. Um, but thank you very much. I very much enjoyed um, speaking with you. Very insightful. Um, and, you know, um, th thank you again. Thank you for having me. And that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.